Good day, everyone. Uh, well, we are seeing um, a very uh, gap up, gap down type of environment that's news driven. Uh, I think uh, uh, almost every day this year, the, uh, the markets like to uh, surprise, and uh, that of course makes for an um, excessively choppy uh, environment uh, in terms of uh, holding on to any positions. Presumably, everyone's in cash or um, has been uh, utilizing the volatility ETFs from the VIX model. Uh, we took profits, as everyone knows, uh, the other day. Uh, the model is back on a buy signal. It senses an edge here. Um, the edge is nice because if it doesn't work, the losses are contained to pretty much 1%, which, which I love when, that, when, that, when the setup happens like that. So you can have a lot, of, in other words, you can have a lot of these little losses and get good stuff. Uh, at these small little uh, losses, and you know, one one nice gain takes more than takes care of it. Um, and since these instruments do move around quite a bit, um, especially when the market's in this kind of position, in other words, we're in a downtrend, which tends to be a lot more volatile, meaning that uh, the profits can come fairly quick um, on these instruments. Uh, meanwhile, the model has fail safes built in so that the downside is contained uh, quite relative to the the upside. Um, now, when the market goes into an uptrend, uh, if it never does again, <laughs> uh, then uh, the model tends to stick with the signal longer than, than one would expect because the volatility tends to calm down and it just kind of enjoys the, uh, the trend that's taking place. Um, now, as far as uh, China, uh, the market does not like that. It's devalued its uh, yuan currency twice now this year. Uh, the first time was on the 4th of Jan and then did it again last night. Um, and that's caused, that caused the 7% circuit breaker on the Shanghai composite to trigger twice. Uh, so consequently, uh, China made an announcement uh, about an hour ago saying that they are going to ban the circuit breaker because they believe that it's actually creating more volatility than less volatility. Um, but that, that'll be remain to be seen. We'll see uh, tonight uh, when the Chinese market opens what happens. Um, we all know last night. Uh, within half an hour, uh, the 7% uh, circuit breaker was hit. So since uh, Chinese markets are now free to fall where they may, uh, tonight should be interesting um, because it also coincides with uh, Friday, which is, um, I believe that's the uh, the day that uh, they, they removed their uh, ban on uh, large traders selling Chinese stocks. So some of these analysts have estimated that uh, uh, as much as 100, something like 180 billion in Chinese stock could be sold. Uh, of course, the question is, would it be sold in one in one go, or would it be sold over a period of time? Um, and again, that remains to be seen. I guess it depends on how much panic there is uh, out there in, in the market right now. Uh, you know, the Chinese market has gone swiftly lower since the start of the year. Um, you can see on the FXI, which is a gauge of uh, the larger stocks, in uh, China, um, and uh, the question is, is it going to waterfall like it has before? It waterfalled in uh, June, uh, June, July of last year, and it did it waterfall again in August, um, and it looks to me, based on the technicals, that uh, the downtrend is still very much intact because it is hitting new lows. Uh, it hit new lows today, uh, and so I think the odds uh, perhaps are in favor of uh, the market heading lower in China, and that in turn can drag down other uh, world markets. So, uh, yeah, it's an exciting ride all, all of a sudden. Um, 2016, as we said, <laughs> promised, or potentially promised to, to uh, deliver more volatility, and it already is doing it in um, quite stellar fashion. So, um, even more important for investors to understand the risk tolerance levels um, so they can position size. Uh, we know that oil continues to slide. Uh, the fact that Ch the Chinese economy is, um, is foundering uh, means that there is going to be even less uh, demand on oil. So uh, oil is seeing prices it hasn't seen in more than 10 years. Uh, the Commodity Research Bureau Index also is uh, seeing prices it hasn't seen since, uh, I think, 1973. Uh, so not all is well in the world, uh, that's for sure. And uh, the best way to, to navigate these kinds of environments is to, um, as we've done for the last couple of years now, uh, take your profits when you have them in, in regard to stocks, 
Um, the same could be said with regard to uh, the volatility model because the profits, as you saw, came very quickly on UBXY the other day. Uh, and that's not the first time. Uh, some members may remember when uh, we were in, beta, in the early beta stages of the model, uh, the VIX, uh, not the VIX, the VXX rose over 20% over, I think, three days. Meaning the UBXY was over 40% in that same amount of time. And we did advise at the time that members might want to take at least partial profits off the table. So it's not uh, unusual, especially when the market's in a downtrend like it is right now, for these instruments to start price. Uh, so the model is sensing an edge here. Again, if, if it works, uh, my hunch based on all the testing that I've done is that the profits will be potentially in the double digits, maybe a little bit of double digits. But as I said before, the stop loss on this particular trade is right about 1%. So your risk reward is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and I would say that uh, the model prefers these sorts of market environments where um, the volatility is, is elevated because the profits can come fairly quickly. Um, of course, trading markets are nice too, but then those are pretty dull to the model. It just sits on the signal and, uh, and, and hopefully uh, accrues profits uh, as the market gets higher. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Gil. Uh, let's see. I think uh, so far this has been a pretty exciting uh, start to the new year. And uh, the interesting thing here is that it's, I don't really see this as a buy, a gap up, gap down market, Dr. K. It looks more like just gap down so far this year. I mean, last in December is gap up, gap down. Now, now we're just gap down. Let's see, one, two, three gaps to the downside in 2016 so far. You're coming down into... The, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. K. Go ahead. No, I meant I meant strictly in terms of the volatility instruments. Uh, they gapped up. No, sorry, they yeah, gapped up on the fourth, and they gapped down, and then they gapped up again. Yeah, I see what so, you mean. So, uh, yeah, for in terms of the fixed volatility model, but uh, yeah, in terms of the overall market, I think I know what you're going to be saying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you're coming right, right now. You're coming down into this area of congestion, which defined uh, the two bottoms in August, late August, late September. And it was announced a little while ago that the uh, Chinese authorities, who uh, you know, the omniscient, uh, omnibenevolent Chinese authorities, uh, are going to solve the problem by removing the circuit breakers uh, when trade opens up in China at. Uh, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 5.30 p.m. my time here in the West Coast, and I think that would be, what, 9.30? Uh, no, what time would that be where you're at? We're six, you're six hours difference, right? So you're going to be uh, 11.30 p.m. in Rio uh, in Brazil. And so uh, we'll see what happens. But I think, you know, if, if you think about this phenomenon of uh, people needing to raise liquidity uh, in China and dumping stuff and all of a sudden they can't sell their stocks because the market's been halted they start to the selling starts to spill over into European markets and our markets and anywhere else where people start uh, to sell what they can rather than what they want to and so in the near term I, I don't know if it, it creates an oversold bounce from here because you are down a fair bit over the last six trading days and if you were going to play the short side, uh, it seems to me, on at least in these stocks I've been playing with, like if you look at something like a work day, I didn't come in with any positions into the new year. But we had the gap down, and the market just churned around. So even if you were trying to get short that day, it was a little bit uncertain because you're undercutting all these lows here uh, in the stock, which I think coincided with uh, the, the NASDAQ here undercutting all these lows. Okay, And then it closed near the peak of the range even though it's still a huge huge gap down move and still very weak and you couldn't get much of a rally the next day so this was uh, gave you an opportunity if you treated these you can see sort of a fractal head and shoulders here you see that here's your head and the right side of the head in a fractal head and shoulders is very similar to the way it would look on the weekly chart of a big normal head and shoulders pattern where usually the right side of the head will be accompanied by a pretty good volume spike on the sell side and you see that here uh, back in roughly towards mid-December. Uh, and and so you see this head and shoulders. The neckline is here. It's breaking the neckline on Monday. It, it does a little undercut and rally. But notice if you treated this as a shortable gap down breakout, 
The high of the day here at 78.65, as you rally up towards it, you can use that as a stop if you're going to treat this as a shortable gap down based on the break through the neckline and then the subsequent undercut and rally, which looks logical, okay, on a short-term basis, and you get short the thing here, and then it blows, um, you know, and I, I covered some yesterday near the close. I thought it undercut this low, and of course, it's going to go down a little bit more today. That will always happen. If you get a good score on a short sell, no matter where you cover it, it's going to go just a little bit higher, a little lower from there, rather, and uh, just to piss you off. But, you know, that happens, uh, but who cares? If you make money and you're in a sort of a... a, a extended position on downside, I'd be looking for a rally in here, but I'm not sure where that would likely carry into. You've got two gaps to the downside here in this pattern, maybe to the high of this, this day to get in, but maybe what we'd rather do is look at some of these other names, particularly big stock names, because uh, and we called Apple a short a long time ago. We considered it a thematic short. Uh, here you had a little bit of evidence with the pocket pivot uh, that, that it might try and make a run for the highs and that failed when that failed at the 200 day line you saw resistance here at uh, the 120 level and when it broke the 50 day we talked about it in a market lab report pre-market pulse version and the stock has gone down straight down since then today you undercut the 100 level but you're way down in the pattern let's look at the weekly uh, to get an idea of where you are and you're coming down on top of this little structure here uh, which also notice on uh, capitulation Monday we undercut the way it looks on the weekly chart. It's a big undercut of this, uh, these two little bases actually here. Although this would be a, a, a more of a real flat base if you're into labeling bases. But you're heading down into the top of that, and you're through the hundred level. So it's really not clear to me if this is a place where you're going to bounce or you're just going to keep moving lower. In any case, what I would be watching for if you're short the stock. Uh, closer to the 50-day or even on this rally into the uh, lows here. You see this along the lows here. You ran up into them and just, just above the 10-day, and that was an area of overhead resistance. So it's always important to watch moving averages 10-day, 20-day, 50-day, and 200-day. 20 days in exponential. That's the only exponential one I have on my charts. Uh, you want to watch the rallies into these, especially if they coincide with areas of overhead resistance. Now, to be realistic and practical about how one would look at this, if you were trying to short into the 10-day, you didn't go too far past it here, and you get up into this overhead resistance. But if you notice, to me, areas of resistance and moving averages are all fuzzy lines. They're not. I don't draw hard lines and and think of that as uh, you know the the line in the sand, so to speak. They're, they're fuzzy zones, and you can see that you could get up a little further into these lows along here, and that would take you closer to the 20 days. So depending on what the general market does, I think that generally sets the stage for what the stock's potential is on a reaction rally and how far up it can rally. So I know I talk about this a lot, but that's one thing you always want to be cognizant of when you're seeing these things uh, break down. Where, where might you be able to get in on a rally, and where could it carry? Uh, based on a couple of different scenarios, uh, which in turn are based on where your points of resistance might lie within the chart pattern. So, and it's fluid. You got to be ready to back away and maybe come after a little higher uh, in the pattern. So, uh, hey, Dr. K, a real quick question for you. I'm just going to let you answer uh, since it's relevant to your immediate discussion. Uh, the stop loss you talk about in your in the VIX model, I'm assuming, does not take into account the overnight gaps. Yes or no? Oh, it does. Uh, if if uh, the model uh, the model definitely takes into account if if you're sitting if the model's sitting on say a signal and in the market let's say it's on a buy signal so it's long UBXY and overnight UBXY gaps down ten uh, percent. You know, let's like like it's been doing. Uh, you know, since the start of this year, um, or gaps up 10%. You know, the model takes that into account. Uh, so, in other words, uh, that is an inherent risk if you're holding a position overnight. That uh, that that instrument in question, the gap or gap down, um, on a new, typically on a news driven event. So again, um, knowing that uh, people should position size accordingly to their risk tolerance, um, and uh, in 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 all the Testing that I've done on this model, I would like to say that the odds of um, a big loss, let's say uh, a loss of 
ten uh, percent in one go on the UBX fly. It's pretty very. It's pretty rare. Uh, so that that might give some people comfort. It can happen, but it's very unlikely. Um, generally speaking, uh, when there's a failsafe, say designed for two percent loss in uh, one X ETF like VXX or XIV, uh, the market can gap gap through that failsafe. But uh, in tests, it generally you know if it gaps through, it might gap through by three or four percent. So maybe you're sitting on a five to six percent loss. Um, and so, yeah, 10% losses, you know, that uh, it, it usually requires a very volatile market environment for that to occur. Uh, and uh, I would say that we are in that kind of volatile market environment. So, in other words, uh, tomorrow when the market opens, I wouldn't be surprised to see these instruments uh, gap. Hopefully, uh, UBXI will be gapping higher because the Chinese market may sell off once again and that may put added pressure on the U.S. market futures. But just be aware. Just be aware of uh, these instruments. And, and, and position sizing is very critical because uh, obviously if you're over-positioned in, in something like UBXY, um, you can get your head handed to you uh, very quickly uh, and it might cause you to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. In other words, the model may stay on a buy signal for UBXY but if you're sitting on a, on a loss that's bigger than what you can stomach, you might find yourself uh, selling the whole position uh, prematurely. So, and I mean, it's, all these rules, of course, apply to stocks. They always apply to every type of uh, position that you're going to be taking in the markets. But I think it's amplified here with these sorts of instruments because they are quite volatile. Yeah, tomorrow might depend on uh, what happens tomorrow in our markets might depend on what happens in China overnight. Uh, you also have the jobs number coming out tomorrow. Someone's asking about that. But, you know, the, I think the fact that the, the Chinese authorities, the omniscient, omnibenevolent ones, uh, took the circuit breakers off or are going to when trade opens up this morning uh, in China or tomorrow morning in China, which is tonight for us, uh, the, the removal of the circuit breakers puts people in a position of thinking they can sit there and wait unless things start to get hairy right away. So I don't think you can really tell. It could take some of the pressure off our markets near term and set up put an oversold bounce. But I think you're, you're already, if you look at the chart, you're already in a position, I think, for an oversold bounce. If you look at the NASDAQ on a weekly chart, uh, you can see that... Uh, if you look at the weekly closes, you, you could potentially undercut these lows. You might head lower uh, uh, from here. You could rally. So I, I don't know. I think you have to watch what individual stocks are doing. And like as we're showing, Apple's been coming down. So you know you may have uh, further to go there. It may need to undercut this low over here at 92 before it stops. You have another one that we've liked as a short thematically. Uh, but it's on, you know, this has been chopping back and forth. It's in a slowly uh, rising uptrend channel. You had a pocket pivot here, which is very subtle, but that that was immediately quashed. And you'll see pocket pivots, which you don't know at the time whether they're valid or not, but you will find out fairly quickly whether they are. I mean, no different than seeing a breakout in Amazon. You know, is that a valid breakout? Well, my tendency is to sell into breakouts trying to buy on constructive weakness you see there's a voodoo day here and that that has failed so you have to see how these things play out and then they become actionable again on the short side so when this thing gaps through the 200 day line here's another potentially shortable gap down uh, stock opened up at like 23067 or something like that what was it on that day 23072 rather and uh, it got to a high of 231.38. So you could have treated that as a shortable gap down using the 231.38 high as a stop. And uh, now you're, you've rallied, or you've, you've broken below the 50-day line. You hovered around and see again, you had a little bit of a rally up into this low here, a little bit overhead, and it closes back below the 50-day. You could have gotten short here using the high of the day as a stop. That was a possibility. The stock's broken down. It's undercutting this low here. And I would be watching for rallies into the 50-day line as potentially shortable. But this is a big stock NASDAQ name that's breaking down. It has been for a while. But it was starting to look like it might come back to life. And I would be open to that possibility if it occurs. In this market, you have to be open to any possibilities in real time and have an open mind about them when they're occurring. If you get locked into a bearish or bullish point of view, 
uh, or try to put labels on the market like marketing uptrend, market out to lunch, etc. Uh, I just think you're going to have to trouble. You have to move with this, and it's a trader's market. It's not a trend followers market. So if you're trying to follow a trend, uh, if you're trying to call a trend, I think it's all just kind of silly uh, academic pointlessness because. Uh, Every time the market swings one way, it, it finds support and rallies back the other way, and that's basically what we've had. Whether we're going into a bear market remains to be seen, but I'd watch where these big stock names that have started to break down end up going. So we see, for example, Facebook, which has been a big leader for a while, long run, uh, trying to break out here. You didn't have any volume uh, three days before Christmas. And you gap down below the 50-day the line. You actually closed below on the last day of trade in 2015. On New Year's Eve, and you undercut these lows here. You see that, and then you rally back up into the underside of this base here, and now we're rolling back to the 100 level. So far, it's been holding support right there. So you might watch to see how the Sachs rallies into the 50-day might become shortable. Uh, let's look at uh, Amazon. We just looked at that, which is the A in the so-called Fang stocks, and this one's done the same thing. You busted through. The 50-day uh, on Monday, you're undercutting these lows, maybe a rally to the 50-day, which is what I'd like to see uh, occur because it'll give you a sense of whether these things are falling back into uh, coming into shortable range and they're going to break down again. Of course, you got earnings at the end of the month, which tends to complicate things. So we'll go to Netflix. This had a pocket pivot yesterday. Dr. K, would you buy this pocket pivot? Uh, well, yeah, I think we all know the answer to that. Um, you know, okay. straight up from the bottom, it doesn't look, you know, the market's not right. Uh, the market doesn't look right. It had a gap lower on the first of the year. So, you know, this is a name to be, you know, this is a potential short sale setup uh, if it does the right thing, but certainly not on the long side. Yeah, I, it went up on news that they're now available in 160 countries. And you can see here on the 620 chart, you rallied up. You got a little extended on the MACD. And you've broken down, and maybe you're going to head for a sell signal. So it may be coming into short sell range here. That's something to uh, keep an eye on. I think this thing's probably topping. I think they used the news yesterday, which I think everybody knew it was coming. Uh, use the news to sell into, and it, but it generates a strong rally. But again, remember, a loose base. We've been looking at this for a while. A failed breakout. And you did find support near the 40-week the line. So, you know. Close enough, but it was the news really that got it going. Finally, the G in the Fang stocks, and the fact that you have Fang stocks are the big uh, thing that's working or has been working in this market tells you just how narrow it's been. But here's another one broke the 50-day. Uh, does a rally back up to the 50-day make it shortable? So as we go into earnings, I'm watching maybe one scenario is that you see these things rally after earnings right up into their 50-day lines. And they become shortable after earnings. I'm not sure I'd want to short them and uh, sit through earnings because you never know what the outcome is going to be. It's better to, to wait to see how things play out after earnings uh, come out, I think. Uh, and in this case, with all of these stocks, with earnings coming out, I think in the last, well, Netflix actually is in a uh, week after next. And then after that, you have Facebook, Amazon, and Google, I believe, in the last week of January. And you should watch for rallies up into the 50-day line at that point should they occur. If you look at Microsoft, same same thing. You see how all these patterns are the same? And you get a you get a breakdown through the 50-day. It actually closes above the line, but notice how it gets resistance at the 20-day line. And remember, when you have a failing pattern, a failed breakout, a late-stage failed base, whatever you want to call it, you can often see a stock break the 50-day and push back up to the 20-day line, which becomes a, a, an important moving average to watch in combination with the 50-day. Sometimes I only get back up to the 50-day. Sometimes the 20-day becomes more relevant, and that can be either from a position above the 50-day or in a position below the 20-day. And if you look at the new book or have read the new book, uh, Short Selling with the O'Neill Disciples, you will see that uh, that's one thing I talk about uh, is the importance of the 20-day line in a late stage failed base. Let's see, no more questions. Interesting. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. Let's see, let's look at some more big stock NASDAQ names. That's been where the leadership is and what's been holding up and holding this market up and that's what's been busting apart the last few days and I think that's probably significant. 
So in my view, you know, you got to watch how these play out because these could be the beginnings of major tops in a number of these names. And if they are, then I would expect to see another rally up to the 50-day line, at which point they would become shortable, hopefully after earnings. Okay, The earnings uh, roulette season factor throws a monkey wrench into any short selling operations because then you have to decide how long you're going to give the stock on the downside before earnings show up or if you're going to try and hold through, which I, I'm not really into. Uh, and I, but I think once things clarify, and I'm hoping, keep my fingers crossed, that we do see some rallies in some of these names right back up into the 50-day after earnings, uh, that could set up um, optimal short sale points. But we have to also watch how these play out because they are going to give us a very clear clue about where this market is headed as we progress uh, through January and through the rest of uh, 2016. So, uh, let's look at... I don't know. What, what do I want to look at? Priceline. There's another big stock Nasdaq name. This one's been blown apart for a while. Now, here's a, an example of how you had a gap down. This one actually was shortable here uh, as you failed at the 50-day uh, line because if you look at this, it was a... Remember, I've been talking about this wide, loose uh, double bottom. If you go back and look at some of the... Uh, webinars at that time, you'll notice that I was ta talking about this this pattern, which is fairly wide and loose. I guess I could try and make it look less wide and loose, but it's still wide and loose. There aren't a lot, there's no tight areas and there's not a lot of tight closes. So when you break out, you fail. So once you fail, you're, you're busting through the breakout point, which I guess would be the midpoint of this uh, W pattern. And, uh, you know, I'm not all that specific about buy points. I think a lot is just dogma and mumbo jumbo but if you use that as a reference point for the breakout you can use a new high it's failed here this week and once you break through the 50 day line you get a little rally up into the 50 day it breaks bounces off the 200 day rallies to the 10 day breaks for the 200 day bounces back so you're starting to see how the late stage failed base bounces between two big moving averages the 50 day and the 200 day and at points in between you may find that the 20 day provides some short term resistance or maybe more clearer resistance or, or more substantial resistance like it did uh, several days ago here where it reversed back below the 20 day and boom busts through gaps through the 200 day now on Tuesday and this is what I'm talking about you had a brief entry window and I'm not going to tell you that it's uh, a slam dunk because you have a basis for taking positions and in this case you have a basis or a clear reference point for a very nearby stop in which in this case the 200 day moving average and and so what you would do if you did take a position there, and, you know, I, I see some people say, oh, I'm afraid to short it here. I'm, as long as you have a place where you uh, can set a stop that's very tight, because I think tight stops in this market are essential, then you're, you can place a trade. You know, just stick to your stop. I think when people say they're afraid to do this or that, it tells me that, well, they're going to set a stop, but they're not, they don't have any intention of following it, and they're afraid that they're going to sit there and watch the stock go through their stop and not stop themselves out. And I think that's where that fear comes from, is that you're going to be stupid and not follow your own rules. But I think if you are a disciplined trader, you know where your out points are, and you know the setup, what the setup you're looking at is. So in this case, it's a late stage failed base, but now busting after testing twice, the 200-day line on the rule of three says that everybody gets fooled a third time, right? And uh, boom, it goes through, and you think, oh, I'm too late, it's already gapped down, but you do have a reference point to get short here. And this thing's down another, you know, what, 100 points, 90 points to the low here this morning. So that's uh, that's pretty decent uh, pointage, I guess, as Jesse, Jesse Livermore might refer to it. He liked to take points out of stocks that are priced as high. But you can also see now that the normal evolution often, and it's when I, what caused me to start studying late stage failed bases, is uh, the fact that I noticed that the break off the peak in a head and shoulders, because now you're noticing it's a head and shoulders. So you got the head here, and the left shoulder, two left shoulders, and a right shoulder here. So this has gone from a late stage failed base here, about nine weeks ago, to now it's a head and shoulders, and I, I'm not sure where you draw the neckline here. Maybe it's it's busting it now, uh, but the short sale points were evident here at the 50-day or the 10-week and the 40-week or the 200-day right here, and it's evolving into a head and shoulders, and that's very typical for what a late-stage failed base will do because my original studies uh, focus on the break. When I was focusing on the break 
off the peak of the head in head and shoulders formations, I notice that oftentimes that formed as a result of a late stage breakout failure. So one leads to the other. And uh, as you probably know from reading any of the two books that I've written on short selling, the first one with Bill O'Neill, the second one with Dr. K, that th this is how they tend to work. Uh, they work out, and and so you know, be cognizant of all these factors and how it plays out on the short side. Not that the short side is all that easy, and I would even say trying to catch entries this week has been difficult. I mean, frankly, I wish I had gotten short on. Uh, I guess Wednesday, the day before New, uh, Christmas, New Year's Eve, rather, and stayed short over the weekend. But you know, who knew that China was going to blow up on Sunday night? And who, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? What if we have a big rally in China? What if the jobs number is weak, and that means the Fed is going to is refraining uh, from raising rates for any further? I personally think they're one and done, but we'll see. Uh, you know, anything could happen. So it's it's still a little bit treacherous. You're way down there, and I think you got to guard against potential snaps to the upside here on the short side. And a lot of these stocks are extended to the downside, but we have a clear plan. We're going to watch and see how the first rally in a number of these names, either to the 50-day, as we see with Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google. Does Netflix fail back through the 50-day? And my view is it could be shortable today. Uh, on the basis of this rally, uh, does price line rally back up to the 200-day line? Um, do we see, say, Intel? Whoops, not sure how I got those letters in there, but I did. Uh, does Intel rally back to the 50-day line and become shortable? Um, does Tesla push back up to the 50-day line and become shortable? Uh, Baidu is another one, you know, that's starting to break. If we look at it on a big weekly pattern here. You can see uh, it took a while for it to break down, but you can see once it broke, uh, it tried to break out here, it failed. And now it's living under the 10-week line. You get a, a black cross here at the 10-week line dropping below the 40-week line. You get a few rallies up into the 40-week line. You can see that. And then you get a nice short. So you could have gotten short, I suppose, anywhere in here and ridden it down into August. But now here you get this big rally. Uh, it's almost pod-like, but yeah, I guess you could call it an utter pod which is another pattern that I'll spring on you all in the next uh, book I write on short selling. But in any case, it, it's uh, it's like this straight down, straight up formation. Back up right into the highs here. It goes beyond all the moving averages. It's going to stop you out if you're using the moving averages as a stop on the rallies. But now we're failing again. And, it, and here's the 20-day line. We break below the 20-day line here as we start to fail. So notice how in most pod patterns, the initial failure will occur at the 20-day line. And if we want to call this a pod type of formation where you go straight down, straight up, and because it's so steep and rapid, that's unsustainable because the stock doesn't spend enough time consolidating and working out weak hands while it brings in stronger hands. It's just going straight down, straight back up, and that's vulnerable to further selling. So it's like a pod in that sense. And so the first break below the 20-day line can be seen as potentially shortable. And then notice how you get a series of rallies into the 20-day line, and boom, you roll over. And now you're starting. You actually ran into the 10-day line uh, last uh, Wednesday, I suppose that is, and now you're breaking lower. Uh, what I would like to see here is some sort of rally back up into the 200-day line that might be shortable. You're undercutting this uh, gap down low here, or gap up low right here. So, and I'm, I'm interested in seeing how this plays out from here. I, I guess there's also a good chance, or a reasonable chance, shall we say, that these things could blow to the downside and the whole world comes apart, which if that's the case, you're you're going to have bigger problems than just trying to figure out what stocks to short. So uh, that's basically my take with a lot of these big cap names. When you're seeing uh, some of these other things, look at Love. Uh, this is the late stage fail base as well, and it's kind of interesting because what you see here on the daily chart is a, a flag formation or a flat base, whatever you want to call it. You get a breakout and you reverse hard, you gap down. Now you fail. As soon as you go through the 20-day line, the green line, that's your failure. Notice you find support at the 50-day line. You rally up towards the 20-day line, which now serves as resistance on the way down. As it breaks lower, you get a, a gap up. Uh, I'm sorry. No, is that a gap? No, you had it actually just a move back up into the uh, 10 day line to fill this gap down. And now the stock's rolling over uh, to the downside. And you see, this is sort of a little flag type of uh, breakout here, a descending sort of triangle here. And you break out here, but it fakes you out a little bit and rallies up. Now, 
if we look at this pattern on a macro scale, you can see here's a weekly chart, and this this looks like a big pot. You got a big breakdown. It's it's a little longer than most pods, so it's 38 weeks in duration. I think you're coming up like 15 on the downside and uh, 18 or what? 20. What's 38 minus 15, Dr. K? <laughs> Uh, Sorry, 30, uh, 23. Yeah, 23. Yeah, so 23 weeks of the upside. You spend a little time consolidating here, but you can look at it as a pod if you want to. And and it, but it's a big, ugly, deep cup with handle. It tries to break out. The handle's a little high. It tries to break out. Fails. Huge volume reversal. That can be seen as either a late stage failed uh, cup with handle. And and you know patterns. Uh, another thing I talk about in the new short selling because the patterns will change and show a change in the character of a stock as it moves higher. So the patterns when they're nice and tight and compact and even the, the cups and handles, the double bonds, whatever, are pretty well contained uh, on the way up. As you get higher and higher in the patterns, they start to look like uh, clown's feet. You know, they become really big and they balloon out. And the patterns become big like, like clown's feet. You've seen the clowns with the big uh, floppy feet so it's just a, they start the bases start to look somewhat absurd and that's when they become prone to breakdowns in my view so what you have here is uh, you can look at it as a late stage failed cup with handle the, the handle is uh, or the cup and handle is big and ugly looking relative to the prior or balloon like or clown like uh, relative to the prior uptrend and then now you have a breakdown and now that's telling you much as uh, we saw say mobile eye you know breaking down from this pod here, uh, back way back in July, end of July, August, when that occurred, uh, this could be doing a similar sort of thing. It's less extreme because it's an airline, and you know, uh, Mobileye had the big hypey concept uh, with producing cars that can drive themselves. I guess. Uh, so in any case, you're seeing. So this is one that's that you can look at. I actually put a short out on this this morning. Hit the 10-day line. It's coming down. Uh, it may need to bounce around a little bit more. So I actually took my profit and covered, and took about a buck out of it. Uh, but we'll see where it goes here. But I think it's still in play. But I'd like to see the market rally maybe a little further up, maybe back into the 50-day line. It hasn't hit the 200-day line yet, but it's coming down on top of this little structure. You see that? So that's where it finds support uh, near term. And now I'm kind of watching this to see how it go, where it goes from here. Maybe it does break for the 200-day line just to piss me off, but we'll see what happens. Um, I still think you're in an oversold position. Your risk is more towards uh, a potential reaction bounce in your face. And so you want to be active in terms of taking or proactive in terms of taking profits on the way down. So uh, I definitely take a shorter-term view towards short selling. But I would also say in this market I've taken an equally short-term view on the long side, and we can see that that that's been a smart thing to do. You know, when you see stocks like Amazon break out and fail, taking short-term profits and selling into breakouts and whatnot, if you bought down here, uh, makes a lot of sense because it's given up most most of its gains, like three quarters of its gains since the viable gap up here in uh, late October. Anyways, uh, any other brilliant questions for me? Okay, let's look at some more short sale. You guys are all just fascinated by this I can tell and uh, I'll feed uh, feed that urge to short uh, but I, I think uh, you have to be watching for rallies at this point you don't want to be chasing this on the downside and if you look at Expedia Expedia has come down it's right into its 40 week line on the uh, weekly chart which uh, takes you right in here on the uh, daily chart you broke in you had to short this one I think we talked about this too last week or the week before uh, in a webinar uh, as it was fluttering along the 50-day line and now it's broken down. Now I'd be watching for a rally up into, you could, okay, potentially into the 10-day or the 20-day, which is around 123.40. Um, and the 20-day the is 123.85, if I'm reading that correctly. Let's get this. 123.85 and 123.40 on the 10-day and the 20-day. And up to 126.41 on the 50-day. So you'd be watching for rallies on those, and you'd be looking at this as potentially 
a late stage failed base. And we're also basing its shortability on the group thing with price line. Trip also failing. So you can also view trip as that, that's an ugly pattern. So again, it's a lower and utter pod, as I like to call them. Again, an unsustainable rapid move back up the upside to the upside of a uh, deep sort of cup. And it's failed. And the first point of failure is the 20 day moving average. Again, you hold the 50 day, you rally back up into the 20 day, and boom, break to the downside. Now you're busting the 200 day moving average and below the 40 week line. So you see how that one works? It's an utter pod, a pod that forms in the underside of the pattern. So it looks like an utter or something like that on a cow. I don't know, maybe I need to get more creative with that, but you know, it's a relatively new concept. We'll have to uh, work on the name. So I'll let you guys uh, submit suggestions. But for now, I'll call this uh, an utter pod. Uh, let's cruise around some more. Okay, you got Workday as another one. I think we talked about this one in prior reports. But here's an ugly pattern. Again, that's sort of an utter pod. Uh, rallies up in the resistance here. Now you're breaking. And of course, when what is your first sign that there's trouble? It breaks a 20 day. And then you rally back up into the 20 day. 10 day comes into play as well, but mostly the 20 day. That's good enough. And then after that, you're finding resistance at the 20 day and the 50 day and the 200 day. So they're all coming in into play at that point and uh, then you break lower. Hmm, let's see, okay, if, if love is a short, again, the airlines are all weak, Jet Blue's breaking, probably the same concept. Long run, uh, failed base breakout here, reverses. Okay, what's your first sign of trouble? A break through the 20 day and the 50 day here. This, and this one failed you know, pretty, in pretty ugly fashion a while ago. Then you get a rally up. It never really gets up to the 20-day. Now you break the 200-day and you're heading lower. Where do you stop? Uh, I'm not really sure right now. I'm trying to find a low in here. Maybe this confluence of lows along here. It should be somewhere around uh, 2150, somewhere in there. But that's weak. Uh, Delta is weak, just started to break. So you're looking for a rally up to the 50-day here. American Airlines is weak. Got any others? United Airlines is weak. So the group thing uh, comes into play here on the short side. And uh, we saw the airlines break down, I think it was back in May, back when we were looking at save, if you guys remember, on the short side back in May when it came apart. And that was when the airlines first had their, their correction of 2015, their first correction rather. And that's when love came off in May. You see that and, and formed the lows of this cup that it's now failing from. So, you know, I, I think oh, there's a lot of patterns that are setting up as short sales and looking pretty grim here. So it, in my view, it's telling you that we could get a rally here. That's what I would love to see. Of course, the market never gives you what you would love to see. You might like to see certain things, and you may tolerate others, but it never gives you what you love to see. Uh, but a rally back up towards uh, resistance areas at some point here would be something I would love to see as, as an opportunity to get short again. And that may start uh, another sort of mini leg down because we basically had, oh, over the last six days, a, a little break off the peak. And one mini leg down here, so you know maybe another rally, bounce up into these lows along uh, the, the mid-November and mid-December lows uh, would set up, would coincide with a lot of these names rallying up to the 50-day, 20-day, 200-day, whatever, some area of overhead resistance or line of resistance, and and that would bring things into shorting range again. So that's something I'm watching for. So market's down, uh, rolling over again. We had a brief little rally. I think we got to minus 108 or something on the down. Now we're going 189 and coming down in a hurry. I don't really see anything, unless I'm going to trade, try and trade something on the long side. I don't see anything to play on the long side. I don't think this is a market to be long. And if you are, you're basically playing quick trades on the upside, you know, very short term either swing trade type of maneuvers or just very short-term moves of a few days at most uh, because there's no real trend here. So, and like I said, you know, you've got IBD trying to put all kinds of labels on the market depending on which day of the week it is. And that, that all becomes very useless in a choppy uh, 
sideways market, I, and I would say sideways only in terms of what the major, the big indexes are doing, like the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ, because we've already seen how, and I talked about this, I think, last week, how basically after peaking out, and where did it peak out? It peaked out in June. The Russell 2000 has basically been in a, uh, a corrective market, a bear market, you know, and you've been in this channel. So, to me, what this argues for is another leg down. You notice we're getting undercutting lows here on the Russell, which could trigger a rally. But eventually, I think you're probably going to go on another leg to the downside. And if we look at the broader market, it's actually been in a bear market since May, June, July. Uh, we can see that on the NY, well, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, which is another broad index. And we can see the same phenomenon there. Gotcha. What, Dr. K? You can look at IKR, which is the, uh, well, uh, it's the Russell 3000. Uh, I don't know what the symbol is for that on, uh, on uh, that, that uh, device, but uh, Russell 3000 index is the broadest, one of the broadest. It's like the Wilshire 5000. It covers about 98% of the stocks, and uh, it's, it's been making uh, uh, lower highs and lower lows for, uh, well, since you know, last year. Yeah, so the broader market, no matter how you want to measure the broader market, is is in a bear market. It's it's really been in a bear market, uh, overall downtrend. Here's the New York Stock Exchange composite, and you can see if you draw a line across all these peaks here, it's just in a big downtrend channel uh, with an udder pod here. Huh? There we go. See, now everybody's going to go nuts with other udder pods. And you notice this rallies right up into these lows here and runs into resistance. So you, you're in a bear market, I think, on a broader basis. It doesn't mean you couldn't trade the big cap Nasdaq stocks like Amazon and whatnot on the upside. But when they come to an end, that may be the beginning of the next leg down. And that's frequently what you see at the start of a bear market. We saw it in 2007, 2008. The top was in October of uh, 2007. Okay, and... And yet, let's see if I want to go, all right, I'm sure I can go back there. We're not going to have volume, but that's okay. Here we go. Actually, you know what would be better? Give me one second here. Let's pull this baby up. We'll go to a uh, simple bar chart. And we'll look at the uh, major market indexes. I need to take that filter off. I'm sure there are faster ways to do this, but this will have to suffice. So here's a NASDAQ uh, composite. So we can go, whoops. This will show you everything you need to show to see. So we go back and we're going to reiterate this idea here is that you actually saw the NASDAQ top in uh, late October, okay, but in the meantime, you saw stocks like uh, Apple, for example. Let's see if I can whip this thing out. Yeah, you know what? The fastest way to do this is just to go to. Uh, so if we look at Apple, so keep this in mind, and I've showed this before. If we go back to 2007, Apple continued higher. See, the market peaked here. Uh, in late uh, October, and then continued. Uh, Apple continued higher into for a couple of months and into uh, the end of 2007 before it rolled over. And when it did that, that's when the general market went on a new leg to the downside. So let's so let's point. You can see early January is when Apple broke off the peak. Okay, and if we go back to the uh, major market indexes and go back to the Nasdaq Composite. We can see that after the initial break off the peak, you had a choppy range, and then when when uh, Apple broke down off the peak in early January, that set off the next leg to the downside. So, if you consider the Nasdaq Composite Index today and uh, the S and P and the big index to be not representative of the market, instead think of these. Uh, indexes as being more representative of what the market's doing then basically they had a break off the peak and we've been going sideways for about four months now 
and maybe now we're starting a new leg down. And like it did in, in January of 2008, you start to see these big cap NASDAQ names that have been making new highs, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, whatnot. Uh, they, they all roll over now. So they've been rallying while the broader market has been in a bear flag. And now as they roll over, just as we saw in January 2008, that starts off the next leg to the downside. So that's you know really what I'm looking at here in terms of a macro picture. But short term, getting short now after the market's been down for the past six days straight with uh, three out of four gap ups this week, gap downs rather so far this week. Now I'm looking for a rally to short into. And I think you can just be patient and calculating and wait for that to come. So uh, someone's asking, any ugly ducklings looking good for an oversold bounce? Of course not, Scotty. I knew you would have to ask a question like that <laughs> after I just said I don't really see anything to play on the long side unless you're going to try and play uh, bounces. So if we get a bounce, you know, what are you going to buy? Well, you could look at things undercutting. I tend to think, uh, okay, let's let's uh, play what ifs here. What if we have another bull leg in 2016? The Fed reverses course from raising rates and comes out with QE four or five, I don't know, I forget what number they're up to at this point, but let's say that they do that, and that triggers a big rally. What's that, Dr. K? Maybe four. I'm sorry. They could. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I it think would be they QE4 will. if they did make some And uh, I wouldn't be surprised because, uh, you know, the Fed's capable of anything, and they're not going to be paying back this debt. I mean, the taxpayer no. are, which is pretty insurmountable at this point. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, at, at St. Cotus book, we're in the 39th day out of 40 days in, in the duck weed pond. Um, and basically, we're, that means we're on a tipping point. And I think the Fed, central banks around the world are at their wit's end, and the Fed's no different. And I would um, actually expect them to see some sort of manipulation um, this year, uh, given, if we, if we can assume that this, this year will be fraught with uh, some serious downturns. Yeah. So they could be doing. So let's say we had a bull move. I think you might look at some of the solars here. This is kind of if you look at solar seed, that's a kind of an utter pod too. So I'm not. It's not really clear to me whether this is going to work or not. Again, the 20-day comes into play here, and it's holding right now. So if you wanted to take a flying leap at a trade, Scotty, to answer your question, you might try this one. Uh, I actually bought some. You know, came down to the 20-day. I actually bought some. I sold it. It bounced. So that's all I wanted. I'll take it, and uh, which means it'll probably go up another 50 cents or something like that. But uh, I'm not, I, you know, this might be something to look at. First Solar was upgraded by Goldman, and they put a hundred dollar price target three days ago. That creates a viable gap up type of move. But you're you're kind of in this pattern. Is this might be more like a quasi pod? I don't know, the double pod. So that's you know you got to watch out. But some of these names have been acting okay. But they could just as easily break down. So I'm watching to see how they act. But you know, maybe it's pulling into the 10-day and it's going to bounce, and that's a trade. But that's all you're playing for. And if that's worth your time, then I guess you can do it. But personally, I have serious doubts as to whether it's worth my time anymore. Uh, so you know, I'd like to see a nice big downtrend develop where we can just short the hell out of things and make a ton of money that way. Uh, it's been a long time. I'm going to say when I was up uh, in 2014, when I was up 115%, I'm going to say about half of that came from the short side. So, you know, I'd like to be up over 100% just being short all year. I think the last time I did that was uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I think sometime that was, what, 2001 or 2002, one of those years. In any case, uh, 2001, that's right. Okay. 2001. Let's see, Polo Alter Networks, we're going to look at some more of these big stock NASDAQ names that have broken down. Here's one again. It broke the 50-day right here, and it pauses. See, that's a, if you treat that like a shortable gap down, and I was almost looking at this as a little fractal head and shoulders, or you could treat it as a late-stage failed base. Okay, here's a big uh, run. You have a double bottom, but the second high, I'm sorry, the second low is higher than the second uh, the first low, rather, and so the breakout's failing, and that. And whereas your first reference point for the failures uh, is as it tries to break out. Of course, you know, IBD will be talking about it right there, uh, midpoint of the double bottom. 
and uh, you buy it there and boom they, they smack you right away and what happens you break the 20 day and then 20 day becomes resistance and as you start to see that it starts to cascade to the downside you gap through the 50 day moving average on Monday you get a little uh, respite briefly but all it does is rally up towards the 50 day again where you can short it at around 174 and it breaks uh, down as low as this morning 162.22 which is 12 points which is not a bad uh, move and now you're getting into this little area of congestion which maybe is providing some support for the stock but you, this is another one you know a rally back up I would like to see a rally back up to the 50 day maybe it only goes up to the 200 day I tried that this morning and has rolled back and uh, you know maybe it doesn't maybe it just keeps going lower it's had a big move I, it was uh, pretty funny because I saw a guy on TV all right I admit it I like to watch some of the cable financial channels because I think they're humorous uh, it's like watching the comedy channel for the financial markets but some guy talking about how the uh, cybersecurity stocks are going to be big in 2016 because the, the their business is going to boom demand has been well you know what that's an old old story at this point and of course the price performance of Paul to networks over the past couple of years tells you that but you know these guys think they're giving you some brilliant new concept for 2016 when all they're doing is rehashing an old idea that may be topping. And we've seen a number of names like Cyber breaking down. There's a classic uh, head and shoulders off the peak here. You got a rising neckline here, and it breaks down, rallies back up into the neckline, and the 40-week moving average becomes shortable again there here on the daily, and you're breaking down again. And we have Fortinet, which had a great move uh, earlier, and it's blown apart in a big, ugly head and shoulders pet, uh, pattern. We have FireEye, which uh, blew up a while ago, I guess. It had this big move up and then formed a sort of a head and shoulders here, and it just keep, keeps going lower. You're below 20 now. How low can you go? Uh, so in terms of telling people this is uh, a happening new area of the market, I think they're pretty much clueless. But, you know, like I was observing this morning, you could flip through all the channels and everybody's telling you it's a buying opportunity. But they've been saying that every day of the week so far this week. So why do these morons always tell us that every pullback is a buying opportunity? You never hear them telling you that every move up, every ballooning bubble move to the upside is a selling opportunity. You never hear that one. Uh, although we've advocated uh, selling into strength in this market. So... Uh, they don't know what they're talking about, and that's why they're on TV. So, and that's one of the reasons I stopped going on TV. It's a waste of my time, <clears throat> and I'd rather focus on trading since that's what I do. I'm a trader. Oh, uh, let's see. It's 8:59. We have one minute. Do we have any more brilliant questions? What do you got for me, Scotty? You got to have one brilliant question left in your quiver there. Um, all right, no question. Send me another bottle of uh, Mountain Height 7000 vodka, please. Uh, let's see. Oh, Disney. Here's another one. Uh, this one is also pod-like. You know, boom, boom, straight down, straight up, and uh, breaking down now, failing. Now, again, when you have a pod-type formation, what becomes your first point of reference for the failure? The 20-day moving average. So... Once it breaks the 20-day moving average, it starts to become in, in play as a short sale, and you get one rally up here. I think that was on Star Wars news, wasn't it, when Star Wars came out? In my view, that probably just sets up a short sell. Right there, uh, you had a break through the 200-day, and notice how the little rally back up into the 200-day. And I think that was on news of them doing over a billion dollars in Star Wars. I, yeah, that's a lot of money, uh, I think, and it's great, great success for that movie. But how does it figure into Disney as a big company, you know, a huge company? Um, so there's another one, Tom. So they're all over the place. Let me see if I can pick off a couple others. Let's look at Starbucks. Starbucks is failing. And again, you're bouncing off the tuner day. Let's look at this, a 40-week. It's had a big run. Um, yeah, and so you'd be looking for a rally up into the 50-day. But so far, you're not getting it. We're down 209. It's like 210 getting there. And the market's just weak, so who knows? In any case, I hope I've given you guys a pretty good overview of where we sit 
with the short side of the market. In my view, it came on a little bit suddenly, uh, and also it's a little difficult to gain entries this week unless you were alert to, to that on Tuesday. Uh, but even then, that was a little bit dicey, and you have to be able to control your risk and willing to cover very quickly if they go back up through your stop. So I'll give you an example. Like if I'm coming after work day on Tuesday, and my stop is a high at 78.65, and I'm able to get a short off at, say, 78.20, 78.30, uh, that's a little bit risky because it could pop back up towards uh, the 20-day line, somewhere you know around... Uh, I don't know, 80 bucks, just under 80. So, you know, that's it's it's a small amount of risk, maybe two, three percent. But I'll I'll bail out quickly, let it fill the gap, because you saw a number of other names like Microsoft. I think filled the gap. Uh, Baidu filled the gap on Monday, and so I'm ready to cover. You can see Baidu filled the gap. You had the Monday gap down here, and then you filled the gap on Tuesday, which set up a short sale point there, and the stock is broken to lower lows. So. But I still think it, in this position, if you're trying to get in on the short side now, you're probably a little likely to be a little bit late. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying you're definitely late, but you're likely to be, from my perspective, and looking at the the individual stocks and where they sit within their pattern. So, what we're doing uh, now is just I'm waiting for a rally of some sort into potential resistance. I've gone over several names, so you guys. Can look at the video later and take more more detailed notes on these names and produce a uh, short sale watch list based on the number or the leaders, the actual names that we're seeing uh, break down over the past several days. So, anyways, um, yep. Someone says good seminar provides foundation. There you go. So I hopefully laid out a foundation. Uh, for you guys to approach the short side if you're so inclined. Otherwise, as Dr. K was saying. Uh, hopefully you're in cash at this point because uh, if you've been sitting through this on the long side, you're going to need a big bottle of Excedrin. In any case, on that note, that's all I have to say. Anything, any final closing comments, any final notes of wisdom, Dr. K, words of wisdom? Sharp one more time. Uh, I just wanted to make that quick comment um, on your early remark uh, where it uh, had a strong day on a one-time news event, basically. Um, and, it, and it rallies right up uh, into resistance, and that, that, that suggests to me, um, you know, if, if you're going to short a stock, it's great when everything lines up like that. And uh, you know, in this case, this thing went right up into its um, resistance area on the news of, I guess, yeah, doing a billion dollars over the weekend on Star Wars. Um, yeah, right there. And you know, you just know it's one. Yeah, because you know it's a one-off event because first of all, Disney is a massive company. And a billion dollars, yeah, that's great, but uh, it's one movie, <laughs> you know, and it's a significant one, but it's not going to really majorly change the company's bottom line. I mean, Disney's Disney, and it's going to continue on that Disney momentum. Um, right now, it was expressing a downward momentum because it had gapped lower uh, in late November, um, and so, you know, it's a nice setup. And I, I also see the same thing in terms of uh, my studies on crisis situations. You know, on the downside, it, it works on the downside. When you have a one-off event that makes major headline news, um, and you know it's a one-off event, and then market gaps down as a result of that crisis event, um, you generally will get a uh, snapback reaction. So, um, again, it's, it can be a gift uh, in the right context, taken in the right context, you know, on the, on the crisis side or on the one-off good news event side. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all I wanted to say about that. Uh, as far as general markets, we are in a bear market. We are in a downtrend. We uh, expect a lot of volatility. We are in the middle of a lot of volatility right now as we speak. Uh, so uh, be very uh, guarded about uh, keeping your stocks tight. All right. Very good. Uh so anyways, you guys, thanks for showing up as always, and we'll catch you again next week. Um, remember, if we do start to see things on the short side begin to uh, develop in a more, where, where we're justifying a more frequent commentary, I may throw up some short uh, webinars during the week, uh, depending on what I'm seeing. So uh, you want to watch for those, but we'll send out an email as always to invite the webinar members to such a webinar should it occur. Anyways, that's something we might look at. So uh, thanks for showing up. We'll catch you guys next week. Uh, good luck. Should be an in interesting end to the first week of 2016. Take care.